Okay, it was clear. I hope I hope you've had time to look through the notes, and then um, don't have any questions and try try and look through the notes. The semester is very short, so that if we come and there is some questions you could, you want to ask, then you can ask me there anyway. So let's let's just proceed from where we left off. Okay, so at least we know the conversion from GDP to GNP is this net factor income from abroad, net factor payment from abroad, which is just Ghanaian citizens outside the country, their contribution, less those foreigners in this country, their contribution. That difference should give you the net factor income from abroad. So that when you take that particular thing from, when you add that thing to GDP, then you get your GNP, all right? Okay. When you add that particular um, 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 correction factor to GDP, then you get you get your then you get your GNP. All right. Um, let's move on to something which is very common in economics. Okay, disposable income. Then the basic definition of disposable income is income after tax. All right, and that is exactly what you see in your accounts when you work for somebody. All right, what you see is your disposable income, income after tax. And it is that income that you are able to either save or what or consume. Okay, so disposable income is the amount of income available to the private sector to spend or to save. All right. It is nothing but income after the deductions of tax needs, etc. But there's another component which is transfer payments. Transfer payments are just payments that um Income you earn, but there's no real economic activity supporting it. So, for instance, I, I, I give you 50,000 cities. I mean, there's no exchange of services or goods in return, but it's just more or less. So, the monies you get from your parents are transfer payments. Okay. They are transfer payments. All right. So, if you get a gift, those type of things are transfer payments. Yeah. So, that is part of your disposable income. It's something that you spend, it's not taxable and that kind of thing. So NFP is incomes earnings paid to domestic factors of production by the rest of the world, the less income paid to, yeah, this one we know that already, okay. But for this class, what we are interested in is the arithmetic behind the definition of the disposable income. So if we take it to, I hope I'm not moving too fast. It's just a symptom of somebody who has been talking since morning. So please alert me when I'm talking too fast, okay? All right, can you guys hear me? Please indicate in the chat if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I realized I was moving fast because I was talking to you. Okay, so I'll just slow down, all right? So what I was saying was with the disposable, oh, okay, Michael says I should, start all over again. And why is, how come, um, okay, so, so I'll just try and start all over again. All right, the other one I won't do it, the GDP GNP conversion, yes. Um, the GDP, GDP GNP conversion, we know that already from last week. So what we'll talk about today is disposable income. So disposable income is the income available to you for use. For the economy as a whole, don't forget, we are not dealing with individuals here in this class. We are looking at the macro economy, All right? So for the whole economy as a whole, total private disposable income is your national income, which is C plus I plus G, 
NX, plus the net factor payments from abroad, which is supposed to convert it from GDP to a GNP, plus this thing called transfer payments. Okay, so TR is transfer payments from government. All right, so in this case, maybe we get a grant or something from another country, plus interest payments, okay? Interest payments, okay? So we make a grant to another country, which is highly unlikely for a country like Ghana. But we do, we do make some payments to people, all right? Okay, Lex taxes, all right? So that gives us the total private disposable income for the economy as a whole, all right? So it's your national income plus your net factor payments from abroad, and then your transfer payments plus your interest payments, less taxes, all right? If it was just one particular individual, right, is that the personal income less taxes plus possibly a transfer payment. But for the, the economy as a whole, total private disposable income is the national income plus NFP plus transfer payments plus interest payments minus taxes, all right? I hope that is clear. It has to be clear because we'll make use of some of these concepts in the next few slides, okay? I hope that's clear. All right, now let, let's move on. Okay, all right. So now let's come to aggregate savings, okay? So if I've already told you, or if I've not even told you, I mean, one of the Keynesian arguments is that income is either consumed or what, or saved. So if we know what the total disposable income for the economy is, and we know how much the economy uses as consumption, what is left after that consumption is savings. All right? Can I get some feedback from you if you understand what I'm saying? If we know what the personal, the private disposable income for the economy is, and we know what the total consumption of the economy is. So total consumption of the economy, we can be talking about um, how, how much government spends to pay people, how much government uses to pay the, the, the military, that kind of thing, all right? Okay, so those are examples of economy-wise um, consumptions that you can talk about, all right? So total savings of an economy is the sum of private and government savings. So private savings is disposable income less consumption. So the, for the private person or for the private um, um, sector as a whole, disposable income less consumption. But we already know this thing as the disposable income from the previous side. So if we take out consumption from this particular formulation, what we get is what? Total private savings. Okay. So let me just recap. Total savings for the economy, we are going to add the savings from the private sector to the savings from government. And that will give us the total savings for the economy. To get the total savings for the private sector, we are saying that the total disposable income less consumption should give us the total private savings for the private sector. And we already know about this identity, okay, from the previous slide. So if you take out consumption from it, then gives you the disposable income for the private sector. All right? Okay. Now, when we go to the government side, the government savings is government let, is the government net income less government purchases. So, one of the mechanisms that the government uses to generate revenue is through taxes. All right? They, they generate the revenue through taxes. So, we know. After they've generated the taxes, transfer payments can be affected. Transfer payments can be affected to individuals, countries, that kind of thing. The country already owes some people, they will pay interest payments. So if we take all that out of the tax revenue and we take out government spending, then what will be left will be what? The savings that is made by the government. The government, the main mechanism through which the government generates revenue is through taxes, all right? So taxes, if we take out transfer payment, if we take out interest payment, because we may own some other countries, and we take out the government spending, 
expenditure on military, expenditure on um, 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 public sector employees, their salaries, and then ministers, they are everything. If they take all the, those spending, we take all of them out, health expenditure, that kind of thing. We take all of that, all of that will be in this gene. So if we take that out of the tax revenue less, transfer payment less, interest payment, what we get is what? The government savings. If we want to know the aggregate, that is the national savings. So NFP is the net factor payments from abroad, all right? I mentioned, I mentioned that earlier on. I don't know why I keep getting private messages. I want everybody to see the type of messages I'm getting. So please, please reply to everyone instead of just to me, okay? So that you tend to, everybody tends to see some of the questions you're asking, all right? All right. Okay, so, so let me finish this slide and I'll, I'll allow Ishmael time to ask the question he wants to ask. Okay, all right. So total national savings. So, so when you, you want to send a message, change the to, to everybody, don't send it to just me, all right? I tried to correct it, but send it to everyone, not to me alone. So I've changed it. Okay, so I've changed it as, as it corrected now, sent to everyone. All right, okay, great. All right, okay, beautiful. At a point I will allow you to ask your questions, okay. All right, so, so total national savings is just savings from the private sector and that of what the government sector, all right? So if you put these two equations together, then you should get Y plus net factor payments, less consumption, less government expenditure, okay, and then so NFP is net factor payments from abroad, all right? We spoke about that earlier on. That helps us to convert the GDP to GNP, all right? The GDP to GNP. So it's just, I'm trying to go back, but this slide doesn't want to go. So it's um, the, 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 the payments for nationals staying out of the country, less payments of those staying within the country, okay? All right, for those staying within the country. All right, all right. Okay, let's finish this slide before we go to the twin deficit, then I'll ask, allow you to ask your questions. Okay, so now starting with the equation for national savings, we can substitute the expression for Y, all right? Okay, so we are just bringing those two equations together. So national savings is um, national income plus net factor payments, let's consumption expenditure, let's government expenditure. So what we are doing is we are substituting this. We know what Y is, all right, from one of the previous slides, C plus I plus G. So we are putting this C plus I plus G plus the net export, all right? We are putting it into this particular formulation. And then we can do some simplification, all right? C here, C here, I here, I here, G here, G here. You can simplify it and it will end up being savings. So, so um, total savings or national savings, is just investment plus net exports plus what net factor payments. And this identity is very, very, very important. All right. It is very, very important. And you will see that when we move on to the next slide. So what this one is just saying is that the sum of net exports plus net factor payments plus investment should be equal to what your savings. The sum of net factor payments plus net exports plus your investments should be equal to savings. In other words, we can bring this I to the left-hand side so that it becomes savings minus investment. And what that means is that savings minus investments should be equal to what? NX plus NFP, all right? But there's something important you need to know here that the sum of NX and F NFP is called the current account balance, okay? So this is from balance of payment accounting. 
all right, from balance of payment accounting, NX, which is net exports plus net factor payments, okay, is equal to your current account. So we can rewrite equation two as this, that savings is equal to investments plus what? The country's current account balance, all right? So this equation states that national savings are used to what? To finance national investments and what? Current account balance. Later on, we'll pick up this issue and break it down. The current account balance can either be in a deficit or it can be in a surplus. And the most important thing to note is that if, you, if your savings are not high enough, you will not be able to clear the deficit that exists between, that, the deficit that will be in your current account balance. All right, we'll, we'll come there, so don't worry so much about that. So it, it also means that CA balance is the excess of national savings over investment, all right? So that was what I was talking about, okay? That the excess of, the excess of savings over investments should just be equal to what? Your current account balance, okay? It just should be equal to your current account balance. an agent call. No, I, I'm, I'm still trying to get my Zoom account to work. I still don't have my account. So what I'm using now, especially for those of you who joined early, you realize that there was, oh damn. So I just got another message saying, issue of the government budget deficits and what the current account deficit, the government budget deficit, and then what, the current account deficit. So let's use the national income identity. Let me, let's use the national income identity to demonstrate this so-called relationship that exists between the government budget deficit and then what, the current account deficit, all right? So we'll take this very equation into concern. This you have seen already, okay? So here we have, um, GNP, all right, this is GNP. It is consumption plus investments plus government expenditure plus net exports plus the net factor payments from abroad, all right? So it's just GDP being converted with this NFP. So you get GNP, all right? Okay. And this identity can again be written as this. We already know that when you add your net exports to your NFP, that gives you what? The current account balance, right? Okay, we saw this from the previous side, right? So we are, we are going to do a little bit of a rearrangement. So if we have income less consumption, less investment, it should be equal to what? Government expenditure plus the current account balance, all right? This thing here is the current account balance. So why? So all we've done is to move C and I to the left-hand side of the equation and left this G and then the current account balance. All right, that is what you see here. All right, okay. Now, if we subtract taxes from both sides, okay, so we are going to subtract taxes from this left-hand side and subtract taxes from what? This right-hand side. So if we subtract taxes from the left-hand side, this is what we get. And then if we subtract taxes from the right-hand side, this is what we get. But don't forget what you have here, which is your income, so income minus T will give you what? Your disposable income. If you take out the consumption component, then what you have left is what? Is the savings. All right, Florence. Florence, you can unmute and ask your question. Sir, okay. please. So what is the budget deficit? Like, what is the definition? We'll come, we'll come would... there. We'll come there to that definition. All right. Yes, so, so government generates revenue and it spends. If your um, 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 what you are spending is more than the revenue, then you are in a deficit. All right, that's the whole thing. All right, okay. All right, so we'll come there. We'll come there. All right. Okay. So now, if we take out the taxes from the left hand side, then what we have left here, this y minus t is disposable income. If we take out 
consumption from it, then what will be left is what? Is savings. And then what is here is what is the I, which is the interest. And then we all, as, as usual, we know what the K, CA is. CA is your current account balance. It's coming from your net exports plus your net factor payments from abroad. All right. And then this is the taxes. And then this is what the government spending. All right. This is the taxes and this is the government spending. All right. Now, now let, let, let's, let's move on. All right. So, so from this very last equation, what we have here is what we have on the next slide. All right. Saying that the difference between your savings and investments is equal to what your current account balance minus T minus G. Okay. What does this equation say? This equation states that, so when we say excess of private savings, what that means is that you are saving more than you are investing. All right, so savings, so if your savings is say 20 and your investment is say 10, then you have an excess over your private savings. But when your savings is say 10 and your investment is like 20, then you, you don't have an excess, all right? You are in a deficit, some form of a deficit. All right, okay. So if there is an excess of private savings over private investment, so the equation states that the excess of private savings over private investment finances your current account balance and what your, 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 your government budget deficit. All right, okay. So, so there is some important um, 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 if you have a deficit in your, so the budget deficit is just the difference between tax revenues and government spending. If that value is negative and your current account balance here, yeah, we are looking at a situation where you import more than what you export. If all of these things are in a negative, then the excess of the private savings of our investment is what can be used to finance it, to clean up, all right, to clean up. It is only when your private savings are lower than your investment that the economy is in trouble, all right? It's in trouble, but that is not what we are interested in for now. Okay, that is not what we are interested in for now. What we are interested in is that relationship that exists between current account balance, okay? The current account deficits and the budget deficit. So if private savings, which is this S here, is equal to private investments, then current account and what, whatever is in your current account should be equal to what total budget deficits. All right. So CA should be equal to T minus G. All right. CA must be equal to T. So this is um, so the last expression suggests that if the government runs a budget deficit, in the absence of excess savings from private sector, straight will be having what a current account deficit. So if a government runs a budget deficit, a budget deficit simply means that it is the gene is more than the T. So if this gene is bigger than T, if you don't have any excess of private savings, then by all means your current account will be in what? In a deficit, all right? So that is all this twin deficit talks about. It shows that there's some relationship between um, government budget deficit and then current account deficit. All right, budget deficit and then current account deficit. So if your budget deficit is negative, your current account would definitely be a negative if you don't have any uh, private savings. All right, so you see why it is important that at least a lot of people must have bank accounts and must be saving, all right? Otherwise, the moment there is no shock absorber from there, the moment, and more likely for most African countries, this will always be in a deficit. The reason being that one, they don't know how to collect revenues a lot because of the large informal sector. Large informal sector is difficult to generate revenues, but you have a lot to spend on. Roads are always bad. They have to be renovated and that kind of thing. So you're always going to be in this type of deficit. So it's not surprising that a lot of African countries have this same deficit simply because a lot of people are banked. They are not, the, 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 the proportion of private savings in the economies are, are relatively low, all right? Okay, Daryl, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah you go ahead, please. Uh, sir, I understand how 
from the previous equation, you got the savings minus the uh, the I mm -hmm. investment. But when, yeah, investment. But when it came to the capital account balance, how did it become a negative sign? Then the bracket T minus G because it was positive before you subtracted tax. Then all of a sudden, it became a negative balance for the capital account. Yes. Okay. No, no, no. So we are trying to assume that there's a deficit. Do okay. you understand? So it's just an assumption. Yes, yes. I'm making an assumption of this deficit thing. Okay. All right. All right. It's just the assumption about the deficit. All right. So that we can see the relationship clearly that exists between um, the budget deficit and then the current account deficit. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Very well. Okay. All right, so, so I hope it's clear. Is there any other question? Um, and please, oh, okay. So, okay, so you don't worry. I won't take attendance today again because a lot of people are logged out and they can't join. I didn't know there was a maximum of 300. There's a limit of 300, okay? I didn't know that. Yeah, because last, I don't know, there was a class I bought. I bought the subscription. So I think I could take as much as 500, but this time around, I don't know why. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So, so let's, let's, let's go on. Okay. So now let's come to this issue about um, how do we measure the economic performance of a country over time, all right? How do we measure the economic performance of a country over time? Okay, so basically, all right. So, Teresa, if you have a question, just raise your hand and ask the question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to catch up on the messages because they keep coming and I'm getting a lot of private messages. So, uh, anyway, when, when you get your question, or you can type your question, I'll try and catch up. Um, raise your hand. You have to raise your hand before I can mute you. Teresa. Teresa, raise your hand and I can unmute you. Then you can, that will make it easy for me to unmute you. Because 300 people, if I have to scroll down and look for you, that will be difficult. Okay. All right, so I'm getting a lot of private messages. So it keeps, anyway, so let's, let's, let's just go on. All right, so now let's look at how GDP per capita. I mean, how the performance of the economy can be measured over time. A good measure is the GDP. But again, because of the size issues, I mean, um, if, if, if because of the size issues, I mean, sometimes it's important to deflate the GDP by the population so that you have an idea of how much each person is worth. And that is what the GDP per capita is. So GDP per capita is simply the GDP divided by what? The population. And it's quite a good proxy, quite a good proxy, not the best. And you know who I later on. It's quite a very good proxy to measure welfare, some kind of. So, but how well is the Ghanaian economy doing today compared to some three years ago? A good way of doing that comparison is to look at what GDP per capita is today and what GDP per capita is some years ago. And I can tell you, it has been it has been increasing to the extent that now, if you use the World Bank classifications, Ghana is now a lower middle income country. All right, Ghana is a lower middle income country. But the truth of the matter is there are still serious issues of inequality. I mean, when you go into the data where, where you realize that just a small fraction of the entire population, most of the wealth, a lot of people are poor. I mean, and um, statistics from the Ghana Statistical Service and all those things show clearly that there's so much inequality. And to some extent, sometimes it's not even a good, that's why a lot of proponents don't really like using the GDP per capita as a measure of welfare, but in the absence of any other good measure, I mean, the GDP per capita is often used. If you go to countries like Finland and those Scandinavian countries, they've come up with this greater happiness index, if I'm correct. I, I've forgotten the exact framing of the word, I mean, but they have some index to measure happiness. Not really, they think that measure is probably better than using the GDP per capita. You can read about it, but for you and for this class, what we'll be concentrating on is what? the GDP per capita. So GDP calculates the, the 
level of economic activities within an economy. Some use GDP as a measure of economic well-being. So a higher GDP per capita means higher income or ability to meet basic needs and more. All right, but there are a lot of limitations, okay? There are a lot of limitations in the use of GDP and I've mentioned some, some already. The first one has to do with the distributional issues. It does not matter if only the president owns or uses all of the economic resources, okay? And the rest of his staff, I mean, so if just 10 people, 10% 10 of the population owns almost everything, we'll divide the GDP by the number of people and it will give you a certain picture. All right, which may not be a very good measure. Yeah, all right. So I've, I've spoken about these distributional issues. All right. Then for economies like those in Africa, where there is a large um, informal sector. So this is what I'm talking about no market production, a large informal sector. Okay. The, 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 the entire framing and calculation of the GDP concept means almost everything needs to be formal. So GDP per capita may be more appropriate in measuring welfare for developed countries where a very small portion of the so, so if you have an economy where there's a large um, informal sector, Okay, so GDP by construct captures a lot of formal activities. It captures a lot of formal activities. So if you have a lot of informal activities going on, it will not be captured in the GDP, and then again, not being a true reflection of what the welfare is. So babysitting is not accounted for, but I mean, we know a lot of people were employing nannies, and now it's, it's a big industry, such that now there are firms that are registered, and what they do is they, they, they employ nannies, I mean, I mean, and not just nannies, there are a lot of informal activities going on, all right, that are, that are not captured in the formal sector, all right. I don't want to go into the specifics, but a lot, you know, most of these things, those who sell by the road, the, um, the, 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 the shops that are in people who, people's homes, not registered. Now even, it's more complicated with this online market coming up. I mean, now I buy a lot of my things online and I know all of those, <laughs> they are not registered. So they are all not captured in the formal sector. So definitely for a country with that characteristic, the GDP shouldn't expect it to be very high. Again, if you have a country that has a lot of spending on military, all right? There, there are a lot of countries that do spend a lot on the military. The US is an example, Israel is an example, China. High military spending does not mean our standard of living is improving. They, so they could be, um, and spending a lot on the military, their GDP value will be very high. You can deflate it by the population, GDP per capita will be very high, but it says nothing about welfare, all right? It says nothing about welfare. So it's not, uh, so GDP per capita itself as a concept, it's not a very good, it's not a very good measure of economic well-being, okay? It is not a very good measure of economic well-being. Any question at this stage? Any, any question at this stage? This, this applies self-explanatory. So I don't think you should struggle in understanding, in understanding. In... All right. Okay. So now let's look at this distinction between nominal GDP and real GDP. Often you realize that um, they will tell you that it's always good to measure the GDP using real figures, deflate it by what inflation, so that that real GDP gives a true account of the actual or fiscal volumes of economic activities going on. So real GDP measures the actual physical volumes of economic activity. So we call that GDP at what? At constant prices. Okay, so we call that GDP at constant prices. What it does is that it excludes changes in prices. It excludes changes in prices. Then the nominal GDP is the CD value of all economic activities. It measures the value of GDP at the current prices. So it includes changes in both physical quantities, changes in both the physical quantities and changes in what, both the prices, all right? So you realize that 
the difference between the growth of real GDP and nominal GDP is solely due to what changes in prices. All right. So the, the basic distinction between the real and the nominal is about changes in prices. Okay, it's about changes. It's about changes in prices. I hope I'm not going too fast. All right. Are you guys there? Guy, I, I seem to be talking to myself. Are you guys there? All right, good, Prisna. Okay. All right. Okay, so now let's come to a little bit of a calculation. It's so unfortunate we are not in class, so I'm not able to demonstrate this for you. Okay, so here, what we are going to do is to assume the economy of Ghana produces only two goods, Kelewele and Pure Water. Our goal is to try and compare GDP between 2010 and 2014. So we have 15 units of Kelewele, each going for 10 cities. So you multiply 10 by 15, I will give you 150. Then pure water, we have 15 units of pure water all going for what? For two cities. So 50 divided by, multiplied by two is what? 100. So if you had 100 to the 150, it gives you the total GDP of what? 250. So this is the nominal, the money, the, 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 the money value of the goods. All right. Okay, now for 2014, again, we have 20 units of Kedewele, each going for 15. So 20 multiplied by and 15. Then we have 60 units of pure water, all going for 2.50 each. So 60 multiplied by 2.5, the total, if you add that for Kedewele to pure water, it should give you what, 450. Okay, so the same happens here, 200 and plus and 120. So it gives you 320, all right? Are we good? Okay, so now what we want to do in the next slide is to try and, 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 com and compute the growth rate. So the first one is nominal GDP in um, 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 2010. This is a nominal GDP in 2014. And this one, the changes in prices have been, so if you can look at it carefully, what they do is that they maintain the prices of the goods for 20, compare the prices, all right? so that we don't, we account for inflation, or more or less, let's take away the changes in prices. So realize that the price for 2010 is being adopted for 2014, so that what we'll get is what we all values, all right? Okay. So now if you want to compute GDP growth between 2010 and 2014, all right? So the GDP for 2010 is 250, for 2014 is 450, and then that's nominal, and then the real is what is 320. All right, so here between 2010 and 2014, what we do is we pick the 2014 GDP minus the 2010 GDP divided by the 2010 GDP and multiply it by what? 100. All right, so that gives us the growth rate of nominal GDP between 2010 and what? And 2014. The growth in nominal GDP between 2010 and 2014. The same way we can calculate the growth of real GDP between 2010 and 2014. So what we do is we pick the real GDP in 2014 minus the GDP, yes, I will, go, I will go over. So the GDP in 2014 less the GDP in 2010 divided by the GDP in 2010 multiplied by what? By 100, all right? Multiplied by 100. So let, let me just go back to the table so that you see the values once more. 2010, the GDP was 250. 2014, the GDP was 450. 2014, the GDP was what, 320. So take, take that. What we want to do is to calculate the growth rate in the GDP between 2010 and 2014. And we want to co compute the growth rate in the real GDP from 2010 and also between what, 2014, all right? So I'm saying that to compute the GDP between 2010 and 2014, what you do is you pick the 2014 nominal GDP minus the 2010 nominal GDP divided by the 2010 nominal GDP multiplied by 100. Okay, so that gives you the growth rate. Now for the real GDP, we are using the 2010 nominal and then the 2014 real. Don't forget the 2014 real was computed using the base year. So here the base year is the 2010, using the 2010 prices. Okay, so we are using the same prices 
for 2010. When we did that, the growth rate we got was 320. So 320 less 250 divided by 250 multiplied by 100. So let's look at the difference. When we pick nominal GDP, as if GDP is almost doubled, almost doubled. But when you pick the growth in real GDP, you realize that we've not gone anywhere, a third, just a third. In real terms, GDP has grown by just almost a third. All right, almost a third. So in this example, we recall blah, blah, blah. All right, that is we understand. In Ghana, all right, so Georgina, I've seen your message, I will respond to it. All right, so in Ghana, the real GDP is now calculated using, all right, so this is some information for you. I think they are even now using 2010. They are not using 2006. The value they are using is for 2010. Okay, all right. Okay, so, so any question, any question before, before I move on? So we'll finish these slides and we'll close and then um, next week, no, not next week, Thursday when we meet, we'll look at what we are supposed to do for this week. All right, so Frederica, we want to see how the 320 was calculated. So Frederica, it's not, Moses to say it's why 2010. So Frederica, this is how the 320 was calculated. It is 20 multiplied by 10 plus 60 multiplied by two. This by this is 120, this by this is 200. When you add the two, you get what, 320. So the um, Moses, your question about the base year, I mean, it's an assumption we are gonna make, all right? We are going to make the assumption that in 2014, what will be the cost of 20 units of Kelewele and 60 units of pure water when we use 2010 prices? So that, they, so that don't forget the re, definition for real GDP. Let's take out changes in prices and let's just see what, all right. Okay, so the slides, Prince, the slides are on Sakai. So you can always go there and download it. No, 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 that we are always going to be using 2010. So in exams, you'll be told what the base year is so that you can calculate the real GDP, all right? Okay, Bridget, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, please, I want to know if um, always we should divide it by the previous years or yes, the current year. Yes, because of the growth rate, because we are measuring growth rate. Okay, thank right. you. Okay. Okay. All right, so I've seen your message. Why do we calculate real GDP with the nominal GDP of it? No, 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 no. So the nominal, we are, we are here in this particular example, we are assuming um, what makes, so what, the most important thing is that in the calculation of the real GDP, so, so Frederica, look at it carefully. The prices of the goods are the same. Okay, so that's what makes it real. The prices are the same. So you are looking at how the basket costs using the old prices. So that's what makes it real. Okay, we are taking out, okay, don't forget this component of the there. Don't forget this component of the definition. It excludes changes in prices. Okay. Okay, it excludes the changes in prices. So we have to use the base year's price. And here the assumption was made about 2010. What the, in your exams, and I know that's why you're asking. In your exams, we'll tell you which year is the base year. All right. In fact, we are not even complicating things. What if I give you a base year in 2010 and I say work backwards and tell me what the year 2000 real value will be? It gets complicated. All right. But it's mathematically possible. Okay. It gets complicated, but it's mathematically possible. All right. So the difference between the real GDP and the nominal is that the nominal we are using the specific year's prices, but the real, we are using the base year's prices. Okay, we are using the base year's prices. Okay, we are using the base year's prices. So, so what that really means is that in the base year, the nominal and the real values are the same for just the base year. But for subsequent years, what you do is you use the base year's prices to do the calculation. All right, okay. All right, so now let's come to this thing about um, 
price indexes. And one of the, the GDP deflator is just one of such measures. There's also the CPI. There's even the wholesale something, something. All right, don't worry, don't worry about that one. What we'll be interested in is just the GDP deflator, okay? So a price index is a measure of the average level of prices for a specified set of goods relative to the price in a specified base year. A measure of the average level of prices for a specified set of goods relative to the price in the base year. So the GDP deflator is nothing but the price index that measures the overall level of prices of goods and services included in the GDP. How do we measure the, so is this a price index for goods in the GDP? So don't forget something, real GDP prices, we've taken out the changes in price component. The nominal, the change in price component is there. So if we divide the nominal over the real and multiply it by 100, what we get is what is the value for the GDP deflator to account for the overall level of prices of goods and services that are captured in the GDP. So in our example, the nominal value for year 2014, I think is 450. And then for the real value for the same year is what is 320. If we divide the two and multiply by 100, what we get is what the value for the GDP deflator. If you want to know what the inflation value is, we just subtract this GDP deflator value from what? From 100, all right? Okay, so for in this case, we can say that there's an inflation value of approximately 40.63%. Okay, approximately 40. Points. So this is so this is the inflation that persists with goods captured in the GDP. All right. So you, you ask yourself, what happens if you have a large informal sector and then the informal sector is not captured in the GDP? It tells you that the GDP deflator as a measure of inflation can be lacking because it's only capturing things that are what that are formal. There's, a, there's other aspect of the informal sector, which, which, is, which, is not, which is not captured, all right? So the GDP deflator can be used to measure the rate of inflation, okay? Another concept that can be used to measure the rate of inflation is the consumer price index. And, and that's what probably you hear the most. I mean, recently, Ghana Statistical Service has reported what the inflation rate is. What they use is this consumer price index, which is very similar to the... GDP deflator, the only difference is that I can say the GDP deflator and the consumer price index is more elaborate, more broad, covers all consumer goods. It covers all consumer goods, both those in the formal and the informal sector. Okay, so the CPI is a, is a price index of consumer goods, not just those in the GD, calculation of the GDP, almost all consumer goods. So it contains a fixed typical market basket of goods and services that may be revised as needed. Okay, that may be revised as needed, all right? So we use the CPI to calculate the rate of inflation as follows. So this is the CPI. So P you see here is the CPI. So the CPI for year T plus one. So always note that when you're calculating the growth rate here, it is the new minus what the old divided by the old multiplied by 100. The new year minus the, the old year. <laughs> Princess is going to the same age. <laughs> so it's always the new. Please, we'll finish very soon. Don't worry. So it's always the new minus the old divided by the old multiplied by 100. That gives you the value for, for inflation. All right. It gives you the value for inflation. Okay. So I think this is the last slide. Then we can, we can. So the interest rate. No, no, so this is just comparing. Let me just wrap up on this CPI thing before I come to this um, interest rating. So, so GD, unless you are given the GDP deflator, you cannot calculate inflation, all right? So that's to Angela. You must be given the GDP deflator. So what you do is the base year, the GDP deflator for the base year will be 100. So for the new year, if the GDP deflator is 140.63, subtract this from what? the base year and gives you the specific year's inflation rates. All right, okay. So, so let me just wrap up this and then we'll use the next few minutes to chat and then I think we can. So again, there's a distinction between nominal interest rates and real interest rates. All right, then we know what interest rates are. Generically, 
it is the rate of return promised by a borrower to a lender. So the borrower could be a bank and you as an individual could be, no, the borrower could be you, the individual and the lender could be the bank. And when you go in for some money, they give you that, all right, so if you're coming to borrow 100, what is in for them? Pay the 100 and add some 10% more. So that becomes what the interest rate. But in the place where inflation is very, very volatile or changes quite frequently, you should always be conscious about knowing the real value of that 10% and then the nominal value of that 10%. So the real value, the real interest rate on an asset is the rate at which the real value of the asset increases. Oh, okay. So somebody says there are connection problems. Can you hear me? Teofilo says your voice is not clear. Can you guys hear me? All right, okay. All right, so the real interest rate on an asset is the rate at which the real value of the asset increases over time. While the nominal interest rate is the rate at which the nominal value of the asset increases over time. There's this thing called the Fisher equation, and that is what you see on your slides. We derive the real interest rates from the nominal interest rate by a certain adjustments. So R here is the real interest rate, I here is the nominal interest rate, and then pi E is the inflation rate. Pi E is the inflation rate. So in other terms, if you have the nominal interest rate and you take out inflation bits, what you should be left with is what is the real interest rate. So this is not difficult at all. All right, it's not difficult at all. Okay, this is the Fisher equation and then it's just real minus the inflation rate that gives you the, um, 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 the real interest rate. Okay, so, so this is not this is not nothing difficult. Not, this is not nothing difficult at all. All right, are we good? Let, let me allow you some few minutes to ask some questions. Myself, I'm very tired. I told you I've been teaching since seven o'clock in the morning. There were just two 30 minutes break for me. So I'm very tired. So let, 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 let me allow you to ask a few questions and then we'll wrap up the class for the day. Yeah. I know, I know we are supposed to close at um, 3.20, but I'm very tired. So I want us to end here so that we can meet on Thursday. All right. Fatih, you can unmute and ask your question. I can't hear you, Fatih. Does it mean to find the you definitely uh, nominal interest rate? It is the addition of the inflation rate and then the real interest exactly, rate. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Any any more questions? I will look for people and ask them to ask questions. Those I've not heard before. Yes, definitely you get a tutorial and, and, and a TA to take you through so some tutorials. All right. Uh, there are still a few issues I'm sorting out. I mean, um, 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 so don't worry. Definitely you, you do that. <laughs> Moses, so... um. I don't want to say yes, but the answer is really yes. Okay, budget deficit. So there should be, the idea is that there should be enough that the government can depend on, all right? There should be enough that the government, don't forget the government has its own way of borrowing from the banks. So there should be enough private savings for government to use to deal with the deficit that exists between its budget and that of the current account, all right? But the problem is that when the government depends so much on private savings, it deprives the private sector. So again, you may be solving one problem by creating more problems for yourself, okay? Okay, so by creating more problems for yourself. So pi E is inflation, Teresa, I've seen, I've seen pi E is inflation and definitely um, um, you, 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 you'll be giving value for that. Calculation of inflation, I mean, what you should be worried about is the CPI version, all right? The CPI version. Okay, the CPI version, okay, the CPI version, which is somewhere, all right? 
this is the formula for the CPI. So the pi t plus one is just CPI for the new year, CPI of the past year divided by CPI of the first year multiplied by 100. Yes, there is a recommended textbook, okay? There is a recommended textbook. It's on the course outline, so you can just check it out from the Sakai, okay? So that's for Gideon, all right? That's for Gideon, okay. So, so guys, um, if you don't have any more questions, let's end here. I'm just sorry, I'm very tired. I have just been loaded with too many classes, starting all the way from 7.30 to 9.30. Then I do another one from, I think, 10 to 12. Then there was another one from 1 to 3. <laughs> and then I have to come and do this class. So I'm so sorry. Let's end here. Let's meet on... Um, um,